my first uh, introduction to Code for America was as a government employee at the state of Illinois uh, working in an unemployment office during the recession. Uh, my system was from the 70s. This did not go well. And uh, out of that frustration, I started looking for groups of people that were doing something about it. And uh, just so happened that Chicago uh, was just named one of the fellowship cities. And so I started following what they're doing and going, oh my God, this is fantastic. And I was actually invited to uh, the second Code for America Summit to be one of the first uh, brigade captains. And it was sort of an experience of walking through the desert for years and years and years and then falling into the ocean uh, with a whole lot of people that are very excited and very passionate about uh, innovating government and telling me they want my help. And so um, I now work for Code for America and it has been an organization that has uh, significantly changed my life. And with that, uh, I want to thank Jen Palka for starting the whole thing and introduce Jen Palka. Give me a hug. All right, so welcome. We're, you're all going to jump into the ocean today. I'm having it talk super fast because uh, Derek and Chris have convinced me that um, you'd rather know more about what's going on uh, substantively at Code of America than sort of all the meta stuff. So forgive me if this is pretty fast. Um, the one thing I will clarify is the, does anybody, do people here know what the fellowship is? It sounds like a, a weird cult when, when Chris talked about it. Raise your hand if you know what a Code for America fellowship is. Okay, so really briefly, we get, this is a year, a service year program. It's, it's a sort of the center of what we do, but not all of what we do. Uh, we get developers, designers, product managers, mid-career, average age is 30, to come do a year of service. And we put them in teams of three folks who work with a local government to tackle a problem using technology, but primarily taking a user-centered, data-driven, and iterative approach to that problem um, instead of those sort of long planning cycles that you typically see in government, which were the source of Chris's pain, I think, at the, um, uh, in the, at the state of Illinois. I'm just gonna turn the timer on so I know how far we're going. Um, so our, our vision is that government can work for the people and by the people in the 21st century um, and so hopefully you guys know a little bit about the Brigade program, which is how we help organize uh, communities around the country who can't take a year off to do this, but do want to do this on a casual basis. Um, over the past couple of years, we've really decided to focus on government services, government and the delivery of government services through technology or government programs through technology. And so the one framing piece I'm going to provide to you guys before I get right into the documents is um, some statements borrowed from Tom Loosemore, who's part of the government digital service in the UK, who's done this very, very well. And I think that they're just provocative statements and part of how we translate our vision these days. Um, government services should be so good they're better than what we use at home, better than previously imaginable. They should be able to work in first time, the first time, usually in real time. We should be able to set up new government services in weeks and run them at a fraction of today's costs. We need to, government officials to be able to see if their policy is working within, as it was intended within days or weeks, not decades. We're far from that now, but we all have to believe, if you're gonna jump into the ocean with me today, if you're gonna believe that this is possible within the next couple of years that we can do this. And if we do this, we can create services where those on the front line can help the people who need the help most. That's what government's supposed to do, or at least part of what government is supposed to do, and our, our services need to be architected so that we can actually do that. So what I'm gonna spend um, the <coughs> 13 and a half minutes I have left is like this, as fast as I possibly can, telling you about the projects that Code for America fellows and Code for America staff are doing this year um, and please know that this is a tiny section of what's happening in our entire network. The brigades are doing thousands of other really interesting projects. I only have 15 minutes. Um, so we have six city partners this year. Um, we actually did a few fewer because we are putting a bunch of our resources into uh, projects that already came out that we want to advance and take to other cities. So it's, it's six this year and we have 18 fellows, so these are teams of three. And we're focusing in three areas. The first area is safety and justice. Uh, we have a team, a wonderful team, in Salt Lake County, Utah, uh, Utah excuse me, 
And what they're really doing is helping folks who have just come out of incarceration um, meet the terms of their probation. So about 10% of people don't show up for their court date, boom, you're back in jail. 20% of people don't take advantage of the treatments that have been prescribed to them, uh, the so social services, which tends to put them back in jail. And this costs taxpayers a bunch of money and it's terrible social outcomes. So we're using text messaging and other uh, ways of communicating with them to remind them, you know, you're supposed to be in court today. You're supposed to be at this treatment. You're supposed to, you know, here's a paperwork that you need to fill out, trying to redu essentially reduce rearrest and recidivism. Um, we have another team in Seattle, Washington, who is uh, building off of a fantastic program they have there called LEAD, which basically says when we encounter a mentally ill homeless person on the street, um, it's very easy to end that for that person to end up in jail. That's a terrible outcome. We should be putting those folks into services they need, and very, very often they are already in care, already part of a caseworker's load, and instead of incarcerating them, we're diverting them to the services that they need, and the uh, police officers who are the front lines of the encounters um, with folks who really need care, not incarceration, need to have data available to them at that moment to know where to take them, and, in a very, and they can't go back to the office and look something up over a long period of time. So it's really the implementation piece of a really, one, a really excellent policy around not criminalizing homelessness and uh, mental illness. And we're really excited about the team there. I just was visiting them. Uh, these fellows get to do things like ride-alongs with the police, and they're actually part of these encounters, and they're documenting what actually happens when you encounter these folks so that they really can uh, build technology that's very deeply situated in this actual context that will actually work, and that's a big part of it. So hearing their stories, if I had more time, I would talk, tell you a little bit about the ride-alongs and the encounters. But what you should understand is that if you're ever considering doing the program, which you should, um, a lot of fellows talk about that experience getting deeply into social services or the criminal justice system in our country as the mo much, by far the most value that they get out of it. It's an experience that many of us won't have and it really helps, the, uh, helps you understand um, how our society works and the things that need to change in it. Uh, this is a couple of the fellows um, watching the dispatch in the um, police department. I didn't get a picture of the, the ride-alongs. Uh, we have two fellowship teams working on economic development. The first one is in New Orleans, um, where uh, the team there is really looking at the truly enormous funds that flow from our federal government down to our states and our counties and to our cities for workforce development training. We all know the economy is changing dramatically. The kinds of jobs that are available to people and the kinds of jobs that people can raise a family on are not the ones that we are necessarily spending our workforce training dollars on. So people are often getting uh, assistance from the government to get trained in things like VCR repair. Well, that's not going to do you much good. Um, how can we make those workforce training dollars actually match? How do we know that these, again, that these policies are actually working? How can we match people up with these things? And how can we um, understand the ways in which people are actually qualified for jobs, but don't get them? So we've done some data analysis, and in fact, the Markle Foundation, who's our sponsor for this project, has done a bunch about things like uh, job postings that say bachelor's degree required. Bachelor's degree may not be really required to do the work, and this is a sort of implicit bias. So doing some work on matching people to jobs in a way that makes a, a lot more sense. Um, in Long Beach, California, the work is around streamlining business permitting. They are one of the many cities that got uh, a grant from the uh, Small Business Administration to do what's called Startup in a Day. I think some of that work happened in Chicago a couple of years ago, but making it a lot easier to comply with all the requirements if you're starting or a new business or even just trying to keep one open. Um, we've got two projects in what we call our healthy communities space. And in New York, um, we're really supporting these caseworkers to use data across departments to better access city services. So it's really based in the schools, and it's really um, around the concept that, you know, if you've got a kid in the school who needs some sort of support, the earlier you get it to that kid, the much better off you're going to be, much better. You're going to spend a lot less on that kid if you get them those services early. But so often we're not able to target these kids and get them the services they need. We make it very difficult. So they're actually taking um, an existing uh, program again and make, create it, putting it in a mobile app so it will actually work in the field. 
Those um, uh, fellows, by the way, um, did, uh, they all do very interesting user needs discovery um, in the field again. Uh, there's something called Code Blue, which is when it goes below freezing in New York, the social workers go out um, overnight. So they went out with the social workers um, from midnight to 8 a.m., going to people in need and, and um, uh, trying to help them. So they're trying to understand how technology can help that process better. Again, an experience that um, we should probably all have. Uh, and in Kansas City, um, we're working on meeting immunization requirements for school-aged children. I won't go into it, but it's one of these stories of like the way it works is really not the right way it should work, but you've got parents in the beginning of the school year standing in line for hours to get their kids' immunization records. The records aren't up to date. The, we never know which kids in, in the school really are immunized and which ones aren't. And this is a problem that's pretty easily solved through proce uh, process and technology. Um, so I mentioned that um, we have a bunch of other projects that are going on, and I want to breeze through them. Some of these uh, are simply projects that we did through the fellowship in previous years where folks said to us, hey, why did you just do it for one city? And why is that just going to now be there? Why can't we take this to other cities? Um, we worked with Indianapolis last year um, on a connector to their uh, uh, police records system that pulls out data around complaint, uh, officer complaints, use of force, and officer-involved shootings. And uh, there's a very robust data portal that sort of explains this data. Um, this is um, very important, obviously, for many police forces. Um, I hope that it comes to Chicago. Um, and uh, if uh, the city or county uses IA Pro, which is a, a common um, records management system and police officers, this um, tool that we created called Comport will pull that data out and display it um, semi-automatically, but it makes it a lot easier to display this data and offer it up to the public. We have a, a population management dashboard that was built for the Louisville jail uh, that's spread sort of organically through the miracle of open source software uh, to the city of Denver, and we're working in the coming year to um, take that to five more cities. I should have mentioned there uh, on Comport, this um, open data thing, we've got I think five cities are, we're about to announce the five cities that are going to get their free deployment of Comport and then we'll hope that it spreads to the rest of the country. So all of these are in the state of like proven to work somewhere. And in, in case of this jail management dashboard, they literally did not know how many folks were in the jail at the time. Lauren, you can correct me if I get all the data wrong. But since they implemented this, they have not had an overcrowded day, or at least not since we've talked to them, which has been a little while. But when you don't know how many people you have in and you have people coming at you, you have a continually overcrowded jail, which is not what we want. Um, so that's been a very successful project that will go to many other places. Um, in the, I put this in here because we're talking about, um, well, we're about to talk about some more projects in the health and human services field. This one um, came out of our work on food stamps, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, because the folks in the California State Department of uh, Social Services um, asked us to um, write up some papers, essentially, on the barriers to adoption of um, food assistance in California. And as a side thing, they asked us to look at a procurement that they had coming out for the child welfare system. I noticed there was a procurement meetup. I'd love to come to that. I'm sorry I won't be in town. Um, this procurement, when we looked at it, what all the watermarks of a failed large government IT project. Um, I took a year off from Code for America and went to work in the White House during the time of healthcare.gov, so that feels very fresh and raw to me even two years later. This project looked like that with even more signs of failure ahead. Um, it was a, a going to go out as a $600 million initial bid very waterfall, um, seven modules of uh, software all delivered all at once over the course of six years. Very long story here, but I'm, it's one I will dwell on a little bit because I think it's so powerful and important. Um, but we were able to change that procurement. We were able to help, uh, help that team in California take a different path. I'll tell you a little bit about that before. I just want to say I think the reason we were able to get a great alignment around this project is that there are 475,000 cases of abuse and neglect, or reported cases of abuse and neglect in the state of California uh, every year. And the fact that the system that the social workers use and that the program uh, managers use to try to analyze the data 
um, but the is been out of compliance with federal standards for many years. Essentially, there is almost no usable software for social workers in the state of California is not okay. And I think we were able to make it clear that if this project went forward, we would probably wait six years to find out that in fact it didn't work and we had to start over again. And it could be 10 or 12 years before social workers had the tools that they need to do their job to take care of kids in California. Um, helps, it definitely helps to work on projects where the stakes are really high. Um, so essentially, we in the course of about eight weeks helped them take an agile, modular, iterative approach um, and they completely changed what the procurement looked like. Um, instead of all seven modules delivered in six years, um, it's actually, <laughs> it says six, it's actually broken up into seven modules. So we started by releasing an RFP just for an API to wrap around the mainframe and then the first module that will be delivered is, a, is the case management module and there's obvious reasons um, why, uh, why that. This, I, I don't have a slide in here, but it, it also, the, the, you guys have pivotal in this building. The, um, the uh, request for proposal actually specifies that the vendor must use pivotal tracker, must talk about user stories, must demonstrate an ability to translate, understand and translate user needs into features rather than an ability to comply with a very large set of documents that describe requirements. And we think that that's going to be really important in getting a system that actually works for California. And um, for those open source fans uh, and uh, leaders in the audience, we were able to get language, uh, we, we helped them write language which um, specifies that uh, you know commodity open source components and tools will be used when they're available. New source will source code will be made open and reusable and published with an appropriate license. Um, we in, in, they intend to release the entire project as an open source product um, when it's done, and I think this could really change the game um, for certainly child welfare systems, and of course every state needs one. Um, but it was really interesting when we were in this. Um, meeting where we sort of convinced them to take this approach, um, an unnamed uh, government official said, we'll do this, but only if this can be the new way we do everything. And I think that speaks to how much folks really realize the old way doesn't work. They just needed a different path. They needed to see that there was an alternative and that the alternative was not, it certainly has risk in it, but it's not as risky as something that you know will fail. Um, team, amazing team came uh, in the state of California came together to make this happen. I mean, we'll certainly take some of the credit for pushing the envelope on it and helping, but they had enormous courage to throw out a process that they'd been working on for three years and redo it in the, in the course of eight weeks. Oh, okay, I'm at time. So really quickly, that work came about because of uh, our work on food stamps. So this is how you apply for food assistance in the state of California. It goes on and on and on. It's 50 screens, a couple hundred questions. Some of the questions are frankly crazy. Um, uh, we've been working on better ways to apply for food stamps. Here's a sample. Um, works on a mobile phone and a tablet. Uh, takes just ask a few questions. Gets you uh, signed up really quickly. Of course, we're signing you up on the back end, but for the user experience, it's dramatically better and dramatically different. We follow up with all the folks that apply for food stamps through our, um, through our interface um, and find out what happens to them afterwards. A lot of them, sure, we got you applied, but then they called you for your interview and they called you at a certain time, but they sent you a letter about that interview and that letter came after the date of the interview, so you missed it. So we find those things out. Um, uh, we found out that um, on the online forum, you were supposed to be able to upload documents, but when you attached a document and hit submit, it just went into thin air. Um, so this is a way on your mobile phone that you can actually attach, um, attach a picture of your driver's license or whatever documentation you're trying to provide and actually upload it and actually have it comply. Um, so we've been using, of course, the build, measure, and learn sort of paradigm um, uh, this is outdated, but we're tracking all of these folks through the system and playing back to our county partners in California. This is not just where your technology fails, but where your process fails and people are not getting the benefits that they need. 
I'll get off my soapbox about benefits, but in California, we're the 49th out of 50 states in adoption of this program by eligible people. And it's not because we're evil conspirators who are trying to keep um, uh, trying to keep people off the benefits. It's just that the thing's so complicated that most people try to get on it and then they can't. So we're helping California move that number up. The only state with lower enrollment rates is Wyoming, which is like 370,000 people. Um, so what we're really trying to do is get in a virtuous cycle with governments where we build trust with them by doing um, these projects. We then, in this case at least, we built an alternate app, collected data from the users, helped that data, played that data back to our partners so that they could debug their operations. And in many times now, that's actually resulting in policy changes, which I won't go into right now. Um, I hope you're, uh, there are other projects that are going on, um, uh, many others, that's sort of a smattering of them that I'm personally pretty excited about right now. Um, but I will end with an offer again to jump into the ocean. Um, so there are a million ways that you can get involved with this work. It sounds like everyone's already involved with civic tech in some way here, but you know, whether you've got an hour to work on uh, open issues um, on our civic tech issue finder or a night a week to come to hack night and brigade meetings, um, uh, that's great if you want to give a year, it, if you're in, in a private sector job or in a public sector job and you've got um, a chance to take a year out and really dive into this stuff, we've got the We'll be recruiting again for the um, Code for America Fellowship in the next couple of months. Um, part of my work at the White House was on the Presidential Innovation Fellows, which is another great opportunity. And I always encourage fantastic folks who care about their fellow citizens, their fellow human beings, to have great impact by working in government. And that's it. And I, I, I did it in a few minutes, or like 16. <laughs> Yes. Uh, when you showed the picture of the, the California <coughs> Department of Health and Human Services or whatever department was in charge of the child welfare system, yeah. you said they just oh, not a lot this of one. credit for throwing away what they had worked on for three years. You're being serious, right? Like they. I am. Okay. <laughs> what part was confusing? How long did it take you okay. to redesign the RFP? So. Um, what happened was they had been in a very um, traditional government procurement process, which involves a very long um, time to build, to gather requirements. And I'm maybe slightly exaggerating by the three years, um, it actually, but it may actually be longer because they had had a couple of failed procurements where they tried to get it out the door and then didn't. So this was, um, this was I don't know, second, third, or fourth attempt. So. Um, uh, they, that, per, that requirements, anyone done a giant thousand page requirements gathering thing? Anyone here? I haven't either. You have, yes. Fun, isn't it? <laughs> Super fun. Um, yeah, um, when, you, when, you, when you move to a model that says we're actually going to um, focus on the understanding of user needs and the ability to um, iteratively make something that works, your requirements document will sort of go in the garbage. Um, and so, they did, they, I, 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 I think there was a lot of work that was, let's say, set aside. Um, the time frame that we, uh, I, during which we helped them rewrite the RFP, Coach America Summit was the end of, beginning of October. The vendor, we, the RFP had to go out the day before Thanksgiving. And it did. It just looked really, really different. We held a vendor forum then on December 4th and got a different, some of the incumbents, the traditional players came to the table and about six to, maybe it was a little bit more than six, new companies um, also came to learn about the opportunity to bid on the work. Like companies that had never worked or didn't have pre-existing contracts with those departments. That's right. And I, I, I think it's really public information, the, the, the companies that came. Um, the, uh, but some of them were companies that were born out of the healthcare.gov rescue effort. So they're development teams that have a lot of experience now working in government, um, but have done it, had the chance within the context of healthcare.gov to sort of do it their way and been wildly successful. Um, some of them, I think actually that 
uh, Pivotal came, and, and I don't know if they've bid yet, but I think they were there. Um, so uh, yeah, and other, co and other companies that would, would not have otherwise come. How was it received by sort of the traditional company players, you know, the, the folks who wouldn't regularly bid on these monster giant thousand page reply documents? I don't know. I haven't talked to them. <laughs> Is there, I mean, I guess yeah. I'm just curious, like, did you basically just out with the old and in with a whole new set of, of vendors now, or, or are some of these vendors interested in the new system and adapting their methods? So I can speak to that a little bit more clearly from my experience in the federal government, where, um, uh, uh, does everyone, do people here know what 18F is? Largely, okay, so this unit within the federal government um, has done, in fact, we borrowed heavily in the rewrite of the, um, of the RFP from work that the 18F consulting teams have done. Um, the, I mean, I think what, so 18F, for instance, did something called the Agile BPA, Blanket Purchase Agreement, and in order to qualify for the Agile BPA, you actually had to send a team to essentially a hackathon, it wasn't a hackathon, I guess, um, you, you had to prove that you could work in an Agile way. They gave you a test, um, case of something your team had to build, and if you if you could do it in a very short period of time, then you were qualified for it. Um, and I think what you see is that the the folks who came to to participate in that Agile BPA were all the incumbents, and they sent the teams that they thought could achieve that goal. And I think that's part of our theory of change is. It's not that we need to take all of government contracts and give them to a new set of people at all. It's that we need to change the rules. And if the incumbents are going to play, they need to play by the new rules. They need to have people who are trained in Agile, who understand open source. And give them those rules, they'll either come to the table or go home. But um, I think that they can compete um, on that field, and I think that they will. It's a, it's a really good question. We struggle a lot with advocacy because we find ourselves often in a position where we want to become advocates because we have information um, about how a system is working, for instance, um, that policymakers should know, that community members should know. Um, and we don't always know the right answer. Um, we want to be partners with government. To, we want to be more the carrot than the stick. Um, we very much partner with a lot of advocacy groups uh, in California around access to food assistance um, and try to be part of that ecosystem where we're playing our role and they're playing their role, but we're really, we're understanding each other's um, unique strengths. Um, to the issue of sort of access, um, what we've really found is that um, uh, we get adoption of Get CalFresh, which is the mobile app that you saw, through partners who are already doing outreach. Um, we do outreach. Um, there's, you know, we, for a long time, we would, uh, we, you know, we work in a section of San Francisco where a lot of the social services are. So it's, we can just put flyers like literally on the outside of our office and uh, have people come in and we sign them up there um, or, or work with them uh, in another way. But we also work through food banks, through social workers, through, um, uh, the the other groups in the, in the community where they are trying to you know it's it what we hear from from folks who are outreach workers is I can sign them up in the street in five minutes which means I'll actually get it done as opposed to trying to get them to come to my office sit down in front of the computer and spend over an hour trying to get through that form but we are not in our, our own work um, other than sort of I think trying to call attention to the problem, doing uh, significant work on the digital divide. We do put tools in the hands of people who can help others, though. Thank you for the question. But I'm just curious, how do you build in that sustainability component, or what your thoughts are around that? Sustainability is, I think, the uh, biggest challenge of Code for America and of the whole civic tech network. And the three links that um, Derek or Chris or both of you talked about earlier um, that is the conversation that's happening in, in these circles. Um, the, when, I, when I talked about our projects, um, 
uh, sort of splitting it between stuff that we're doing through the fellowship now and stuff that we are, uh, is our fellowship projects that we're trying to move forward. In that, you should see some of Code for America trying to move towards, let's not just like do this thing and walk away. Um, there's sustainability within a community, there's sustainability within local government. Um, uh, I, I think as we have moved more towards social services, we're getting a little bit more of a culture and expertise around serving underserved populations. Um, and we're really, again, targeting more and more of our work on how can we make these government programs actually effective? We're already spending the money. Let's make the money worth something. Um, early on in Code for America, we did stuff like Blythe Status, um, which was in New also in New Orleans. This is a return trip for us. Um, and um, it was really very, it was sort of, I think, our first test case of if we don't get the community involvement in this right, we will go nowhere. Um, because it was about neighborhoods, adv neighbors advocating for you know, the resources to improve or, or, or uh, tear down properties in their neighbors, neighborhoods. And that team nailed it. They did such a good job of, of talking to the community, understanding what the community needed that that's actually one of our most sustainable projects, and I think it absolutely proves your thesis. If it's got bottom-up support, it's going to stick. Um, do you have any kind of follow-up that you would like uh, to work with the past, or how do you maintain that relationship so that you could go back to another project and build on the success that you had? Um, we're, uh, uh, another good question, and we're sort of working towards that. So um, half of our cities for 2016 uh, are repeat cities for us, but they're not cities where we worked with them in, in a current year and then worked with them again in the next year. And that's actually something we're working to change. It's sort of part of our business model that needs to evolve in order to get there. Um, we've had this um, model of getting support from the local government and support from a local funder. And it's been really hard for us to figure out how to um, keep the project in scope um, have that forcing function of, uh, without anything else changing, the project's going to be done, so let's hurry up and get something done here, folks, um, and yet still have the, oh, wait, this is really working, and this is really valuable, and we want to keep going, um, given the super long cycles of local government, and frankly, the super long cycles of Code for America, which is another thing we're working to change. Mm -hmm. When you get applications and not all of them are received uh, code for America fellows. So we've been trying to figure out where we have the most impact and where the work can be most sustainable. Um, and um, factors in both of those things include, um, well, does somebody want us there, right? Um, it is the problem that the community wants to solve something where we're going to be able to build on past work? Um, this is our sixth year, and so we're, we're trying to figure out where we get better over time instead of like jumping to a new problem every year. Um, so the, we're increasingly um, specifying in our call for applications from local governments, we want people who want to do more of the reducing recidivism or um, incre uh, decreasing the number of people who um, uh, end up with bench warrants for their arrest, which is a sort of sister project to that one we did in Atlanta or working on food stamps. Um, so we're looking for partners who want to work on the same things that we want to work on. Typically, those counties in particular will tell you those things are incredibly high cost in terms of both financial and cost to the community, a human cost to the community. So I think we're in good places. Um, and we need someone who's willing to say, I will s support your team in taking an approach that's going to be different. Um, you've got to sign up for a team that's going to take an iterative, data-driven, and user-centered approach to solving this problem, which means that they're not going to start the same way and your normal technology projects will start. If we don't have someone who's willing to nurture and like, create the space for that kind of work, we're not going to get anywhere, so we wouldn't take that project. Does that help? Yeah, so, so you kind of have to have some commitment of some sort and, uh, from the government Essentially, your fellows are not going to go there and by the end of it just observe. They will have actually done so, you know, and some of their proposals will actually see the light of day. Yeah, I'll give you an example. Mayor Ben McAdams in Salt Lake, 
He made criminal justice reform his top priority. He wants us to solve the problem, and very much. Uh, the, the costs to his county are incredibly high, um, and he buys that the way that we want to do it is at least worth trying. Um, that's a great place for us to be. Mm -hmm. So that like other specific chapters can also take in some of those same lessons. Yeah, so we've got a lot, you know, we, we have our share of those for sure. Our very first year, we had three teams, uh, one in Philly, one in Boston, and one in Seattle. And it's very interesting to go back to Seattle um, having really not succeeded there in our first year, not because we didn't have a great group of fellows, they were awesome. Um, but I think there were stakeholder management issues there. There was sort of clarity of focus there. And ultimately, um, we were trying to do a very general purpose tool. And what we've really learned over the years is that if you don't have a very specific problem that you're trying to help people solve, that is, as um, one of my mentors calls, a hair on fire problem, um, like a general purpose functionality for things like, you know, neighbors getting together is, is, is very hard to get adoption for. Um, situated um, solutions. So having done that in, in Seattle, now going back and having a very, very um, situated problem with clear outcomes and clear partners is, is, a, is <laughs> it's a great do-over. Um, uh, I think in other cases, um, we, uh, we did a th project in Albuquerque the year before last that also kind of never really shipped. And I think it was, um, it, it struggled to find the right thing to do, um, the right project that would really have impact on the problem they were trying to solve. Um, and um, I, that, that probably accounts for a lot, a lot of the times where we kind of swing and miss. You know us, though. What are, what, where, what, what are the other reasons we swing and miss? <laughs> We very often end up with projects that succeed in their local context, but don't spread to other contexts. And that's not a failure, but it is something we're trying to figure out how to, um, how more of these things can replicate. So there's sort of two questions in that. The second one is sort of the, um, does government make it hard to sign up for services on purpose? And the answer to that is, uh, in California, is no. I can say that really um, confidently. And I'll tell you why it's no in California particularly, but I think it should be no everywhere. It's federal money that flows into your local community for free. Like, nobody doesn't want that. Like, there are certainly places in the country where um, there are ideological or, you know, cultural um, issues with people getting, but like we frankly haven't really worked in those places. In California, the reason people don't get food stamps isn't because people are trying not to have them, it's because the process is broken. Um, the, you wanted me to speak a little bit more to policy changes? Yeah. Uh, when it, so there's, there's, um, there's policy that we hear about in the news, um, and then there's like policy on the ground. Um, yeah, I mean, I, like, when I say, I mean, I, I mean it really all of them, but like the concrete examples I can give you, for instance, are like um, uh, on-demand interviews. So one of, the big, one of the biggest reasons people apply for food stamps and don't get it is you've got, I mean, it used to be you had to go in an office and sit. Now they'll actually call you so you don't have to come in. That's great. But they, they send you a letter, when I have screenshots of it, and you know, we, we collect all these letters. Um, 
and they say, I'm going to call you Tuesday the 23rd at 3 p.m. If you don't pick up the phone Tuesday the 23rd at 3 p.m., you start over at the very beginning. Um, like literally, you've got to go reapply. Um, the, the regulatory framework allows for on-demand interviews where you could just like call in and do your interview with a caseworker who happened to be available. And one of, uh, somebody in the back asked earlier about um, advocacy. Um, like this is a case where like we want to advocate for the policy change to take advantage of that, um, to change so that, so that they're, you're doing on-demand interviews or at least reschedulable interviews. And you know, we'll probably get there, but where we start is by just playing back the data to the county welfare directors and saying, did you know that X percent of your people are falling off because they didn't pick up the phone or you didn't even send them the letter about when the interview was until the interview was already passed, let's fix this problem. And then we're in a dialogue around a policy change that they could do to have better operations. But those are the kinds of policies that don't make the front page. That's not what people think of when they think of government policy. But it, it, those little policies matter a lot. Any last question? I don't think there are. Oh, one more. Okay. I, the only example that I have of that is the child welfare thing. We were very um, vocal. Um, but we did happen. It, so I, one of the things I would say is that, and I, I think probably all of you will immediately recognize this as a very true statement. It is not monolithic. It is not heter homogeneous. In any government institution, there are people already there who are like, damn, this does not work. Could we please find a different way? And there are people who are like, this is how we've already done it. We're not going to do it a different way. And there's not, I don't, there, these institutions are large. I, I, I challenge you to find an institution where there is not already a change agent. I also challenge you to find one there, or there aren't people who are risk averse and do not want anything to change. Um, it, yes, we happen to be working in the ones where the mayor has stood up and said, please come in. In that case, um, we did a paper for the state of California saying that procurement won't work, you shouldn't put it out there. And initially they said, thanks so much for your recommendations, we totally agree, but we're moving forward with this as planned because we don't have another alternative. That's when we got all nutty on them <laughs> and said, no, we're, we're, gonna, we're calling a bunch of other stakeholders. We're talking to people at the federal government um, who, frankly, are paying for this project. So you've got to understand, anything that happens at the state or county level, the money is coming from the feds. And um, if you can, the feds happen to have just realized over the past year and a half, two and a half years, um, that waterfall method doesn't work in a very painful way. So they ha there happen to be a lot of people in DC who are willing to make a phone call to someone at the state or county level saying, actually that $500 million we just gave you, we want you to use it on an agile project. Um, it's just not that simple. It's about finding the right people, bringing it to the people who are concerned about the change and have, helping them understand that the risks are lower than they think in the new way and higher than they think in the old way. That's what you do. So yes, we do sometimes go knocking quite loudly, um, especially when it has to do with something like child welfare. I think that's all the time. Thank. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry for you. Now you get the privilege. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Jen. Best questions ever. Thank you, guys. <laughs>